Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Michelle Yasuda and I am the program director for the Foundation for Conscious Living's on online programs. And these programs, Dean's moving out of the way because I, <laughs> I got my stuff. So these programs support individuals, organizations, and communities in generating agency, connection, and creativity on our shared planet. And the call that you're on tonight is one of the ways that we do this in the world. So thank you for joining us. Um, so I have a couple of logistics I'm going to go over, and then I want to get right into this call because these couples are amazing, and we have a lot that we want to cover and a lot that we want to uh, share with all of you. So the first thing I want to do is invite you to the Big Leap Home Network, which is an online gathering space for the Hendrix community. And so when I'm, when I'm finished talking, I'll go ahead and put a link and you can join us. It's totally free and it's uh, like social media, but without any ads. It's our own private community. So uh, I will post that later. And um, if you have questions during the call, feel free to put them in the chat. If you put three question marks in front of your question, we'll see them more quickly. So that will be really helpful. If we don't get to your questions, we will, uh, we're happy to actually go through the chat afterwards and post some answers on the network. So if you're, if you're, if you don't get to it, just know that we will, it just might be on the online network. And uh, so I'd like to invite you into a commitment when you come on over. So when you listen to these words, notice how they land in your body. We find that learning works best when we choose to bring curiosity, openness to learning, and appreciation of ourselves and others into the space. So I invite you to join us in that intention. So what I'd like to do now is uh, turn this call over to first Marlene and Bob, and I'd love for you to introduce yourselves and then Heath and Nicole will pop in and introduce themselves. And then Dean and I can do that uh, with my other hat on. So Marlene and Bob, just please take it away. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, hmm. Hmm. Well, we're Marlene and Bob. We're uh, from Ottawa, Canada. We are the senior members here. <laughs> we've, we've known each other for 56 years. Yeah. We've been married for 52. So we know about conflict. We know about <laughs> we have lots of lots of experience with conflict. So the first thing we want to say about conflict is that it will happen. You cannot live with someone or be in relationship with someone without having conflict. So you need to accept conflict happens and it's not a bad thing. It just is. And in fact, you need to remember that you're, you can be angry with someone and still love them. That was such a big learning for me. <laughs> really? Not how I was brought up. No, <laughs> not at all. So we like to distinguish between healthy anger and toxic anger. So toxic anger is for me on the drama triangle and i know there's been some lots of stuff shared on the big leap um, home about the drama triangle uh, so if you don't know that term look it up um, it involves toxic anger involves blame criticism you know we'll get into more of some of those really things wrong. later um, you know it's not easy to separate anger and blame like that that was a big learning for me like I don't, somehow I thought that if I was angry, it was somebody's fault, maybe mine, it was somebody's fault. Like even now, if I bump my head, I, you know, I'm looking. Who's who did fault? that? Who did that? Who left that cover? <laughs> <Who> did that? <laughs> I did. <laughs> so, you know, just one thing I want to add here is that we've been studying with um, a sex therapist. And one of the things she really stresses is that if you don't feel safe to be angry, then you will not feel safe to let go, to trust, to have a healthy relationship. So learning to be safe when you're angry is absolutely essential. Mm. And I think I that's- Pass what it over to Heath and Nicole, yeah. Uh, I love that, Marlene yeah. and Bob, and what a, a very clear way to, to frame it. 
uh, when we feel safe with one another, we can then be true to ourselves and, and others and live an authentic relationship. So Heath and Nicole were in Phoenix, Arizona. We've been married for 20 years. Been hanging out about 26. Yes, yeah, we and... learned how to drink and party and fight and... Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> make up. Make yeah, up. make up. That's the best you know? part. That was the most fun. Uh, Still is. <laughs> And uh, one of our, our favorite ways to explore conflict, especially when, well, two things. You can practice uh, resolving conflict in the throes of conflict, not recommended. So a few distracting things going on. Uh, or you can practice resolving conflict, making peace with your own anger or finding a healthy experience of your partner's anger we find is best to practice when you're not actually in the moment of a heated <laughs> exchange or some kind of argument. So we love to, we like to say that uh, only 1% of successful relationships is theory, although we're going to share a lot of theory. 99% is practice. <laughs> and one of the ways we love to practice is actually using our bodies. And a lot of times, and we'll be sharing with you all different ways where you can embody what's going on so that you have a clear and a safe way to return to the source of your truth and you feel safe enough to express it to your partner and they feel safe enough to share it with you. So how do we facilitate that for our, ourselves and in our relationships? Okay. We love to do it through the lens of, of body modification or body intelligence and we'll be sharing that a little later. And what, we've been practicing these tools for what, about 10 years now or uh, the, so? The Hendrix tools, yeah. and we're also massage therapists and- uh, Yogis and we really therapy. Meditation, so we have lots and lots of, of tools and skill sets that we comfortably rest back on because we know, as Bob said, conflict's gonna happen. It's not a bad thing, it's a thing. And how can we repurpose it from all this crap you know, this dookie, how can we compost it and fertilize the <laughs> pollinate what we most want to grow in our relationship in our hearts? And we're tossing Hi. to Michelle and Dean. Nice. Yep, we'll catch that <laughs> toss. <laughs> yeah, so I already spoke. I'll let you speak first. Well, I'm Dean. This is Michelle. Uh, we've been together. We're, about we're the ten, babies of the group. Years. Uh, no, Nine, I think it's eight years, eight, years? eight and a half years, eight, nine, eight and a half years. We've been studying with the Hendrix for about seven, mm -hmm. seven years now. And, um, you know, I know for me, we've, I've had a long history of other relationships. And, and so I have a lot of experience <laughs> that wasn't resolved. And so now, you know, learning these tools and go, oh, wow. How much of that was me? <laughs> oh. So during conflicts, you know, learning to, for me is, oh, what is, what is my part mm. in all of this? Because I was always doing that. <laughs> <laughs> that's why those were marriages didn't work out. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And, and I like what you just brought up because we did a lot of our practicing of conflict, uh, doing it wrong is what I would like to call it. Mm -hmm. um, with other people. And yeah. we've benefited from having the Hendrix tools woven into our relationship really from the beginning, actually, yeah. even before we started studying, we were studying the Hendrix work. So study, in other, in other words, before we did it formally. Mm -hmm. And um, so we love coaching. We both have individual practices and we coach couples together, um, which I absolutely love yeah. and uh, have such a good time. Uh, and mainly what it is, is that I, I know that these tools and the things that we're going to talk about actually work. And so the, to be able to share what has made my life so good and our relationship so fun and something that we can come home to as a place of safety, like Marlene and Bob were talking about and, and Nicole and Heath, rather than it being a place of conflict and the place to, to push away from, it's actually the place where the healing takes place, where the nourishment, where that composting, I've been using that uh, lately myself. So it's really funny that you brought up composting and like, what am I putting in my compost? Um, so that I'm super excited about this whole call. And I want to toss it back over to Nicole and Heath, who are going to take us into our next topic. Oh, cool. So 
we mentioned embodiment. And mm -hmm. I don't want to run no, over for you. Nope, this is not. one of my favorite things to talk about because <laughs> early on, I was taught well, to figure out my problems with my brain. And what I learned, you know, in the first couple of relationships of my life is that a lot of things couldn't be figured out with no matter how smart you are. And in fact, doubling down and think if, if I just think harder, I can find a better strategy. And what Hendrix have really helped open my eyes is that sometimes it's not about going through the mind, but through the body to get wisdom. And a lot of us are familiar with the, the field of, of embodiment and more and more studies and research are being shown that one of the best ways to stay healthy, to feel vital and alive is not necessarily to do these brain puzzles, but actually to move our body, to feel our body, to notice our breath, to be aware of this, what I'd like to call our most loyal consort. Besides maybe a person we choose to be with or not, it's our body that's with us from our first to last breath. So how can we begin to capitalize the innate body wisdom, the BQ that is available to us as soon as we are alive? And it's not something we're really taught. Maybe you get a PE class, you know, talking about physical education, but they don't talk about use your body as a way to come up with solutions to your challenges. Mm -hmm. So one of the my favorite ways to modify, we can be it very dramatic and it kind of looks strange, like you're you're kind of clowning around, like your kids on at recess in kindergarten playing around. And we'll do some dynamic opportunities for embodiment. Uh, but also there's ways that you can use your visualization and a, a meditated state of mind to get in tune with your interoception. A lot of us are familiar with extraception, like, wow, the temperature in the room. Anybody complaining about the weather lately? So extraception is things outside. Interoception, do you know your heartbeat right now without holding over an artery? Some people can do that. Some people, it's, they have no idea. Body intelligence helps us to connect with our natural innate processes so that we can be clear of what's true for us and how we might even uncover new solutions. Mm. So if you'd like, I want to offer this little experience, experiment, a thought experiment, and make yourself comfortable. Maybe enjoy a few deep breaths. You can roll your shoulders, circle your neck. Sometimes we want to close our eyes so we can see on the inside, but you can also keep your eyes open. And just enjoy a few deep, friendly breaths, breathing, if possible, through your nose. If you want to focus on letting go, exhale out your mouth. Or you can inhale through your nose. If you want to focus more on energizing, exhale out your nose. But preferably slow breaths, at mm -hmm. least breathing in through your nose. And imagine yourself with something that undoubtedly you love. And I want to disclaimer, don't use a person or an animal. Use maybe a place that you love. Maybe there's a food or activity or a hobby. And, and land on one thing that you love. And use all the faculties of your body awareness to sense this thing. Imagine this thing is in your proximity. You can smell it or taste it. You could see it or touch it. Enjoy a few more deep breaths as you imagine this thing that you love right here in the same space as you. How would that feel? You notice your body sensations when you're around this thing, even in your imagination. Now let's turn up the volume on our body intelligence, get some more sensations by using our intention. So visualize this thing or place and, and be in the same space as, and in your mind's eye, or out loud say, I love, and fill in the blank. Maybe it's the beach, maybe it's uh, a pizza, who knows. I love whatever that thing you know without question you love. Say it a few times and notice what happens in your body, your heart, uh, your, your breathing. And get really comfortable. Sometimes you notice sensations changing in your neck or jaw or back. Maybe there's a new temperature in your face or hands or feet. And one or two more times, really luxuriate in that space as you affirm, I love whatever it is you love. Remember any sensations, anything that changed in your body when you said, I love this thing that of course you love, remember that. We'll soften our eyes open if they're not already there. And roll your shoulders around, look around. We're just taking a little physical transition from 
the I love the thing to the hard part of the experiment. You ready for the, the challenging part? Okay, we're gonna go back to that same thing you love, but we're gonna lie to ourselves. We're gonna tell ourselves a, a mistruth, uh, a falsehood. And so again, get into a place, eyes open or closed, you can see that thing. Same thing that you just a moment ago said, I love, of course you love it. But now you're gonna challenge yourself and you're gonna find out what happens with your body when something untrue is entering your system. And I want you to say, I don't like, and fill in the blank with the same thing, right? I don't like, and I know some of you are like, I'm not going to do that. That's not true. So just know that you don't have to take this with you. Just a temporary thought experiment. I don't like the thing that, of course, you love. Notice what happens in your body. If you can, stay present with it. Your breath might change, and that's fine. But one or two more cycles. We're not going to luxuriate in this much longer, but I want you to get some clear cues from your body about how it deals with falsehoods, how it deals with no's, how it deals with something that's not true. I don't like, one more time, what do you feel in your body? What goes on with your body? Mm. Let's open our eyes, shake that off. You shake your hands, because eh, we don't like to, eh. yeah, shake it off, shake it off. So this is more act. Yeah, this is more active embodying. So you can shake it off. Taylor Swift talks oh. about shake it off. You can only get so far if you do it in your brain, but if you do it in your body, it's a lot more effective. Mm. So likely many of you, when you did the, I love this, pretty easy, right? Easy to imagine yourself there with the thing. Mm -hmm. Did you want to add anything? I don't know. Well, I just noticed that I felt myself moving. I felt flowy. I felt my breath big and wide and expansive. I felt like my face was relaxed and calm. I felt calm and easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that first part was so that you could get a feeling for your yes. The thing that you undoubtedly love and you tell yourself the mm -hmm. truth, I love this. That's your yes. You're starting to get a sense of what your full body yes is. Not a maybe, but a clear yes. Mm. And then the no. Mm. Shoulders went up, breath stopped, and my whole body stood still. Yeah. yeah, I can see MJ's got her hands on her jaw. And I imagine for some of you, there's like this stiffening, this, that's not the truth. Yeah, a little and, narrowing. Uh, uh, uh. And, it, and it's very challenging. And that's why I give you that disclaimer, don't do this in the beginning with a person or an animal because relationships are a little more challenging. <laughs> uh, I do recommend everybody practice this if you're interested in honing in your intuition and getting a clear sense of how you choose yes and no. Practice this several times. It gets easier. And instead of saying, I don't like the thing that you do love, you really challenge yourself and say, I hate pizza. Ooh which is so ridiculous and absurd. <laughs> well, and what I love about this exercise for, for our relationship and our it, it, learning my own yeses prevented me from saying yes to Heath for things that I really wasn't interested in or doing or being a part of. It really taught me my own sensations and like when I wanted to jump in and when did I need to turn away. I think for a lot of us, and I'm imagining many of you on this call, implicitly are interested in caring. You care about caring. That's why you would attend in your free time something about eliminating or dissolving conflict. So you care. And a lot of times us carers are also yes people. We just want to say yes. Mm -hmm. We want to agree and go yes, along with the Of course, darling. I love yeah, everything yeah. you do. I love everything you're part of. I can't wait to play that video game with you again. <laughs> 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 but uh, not only does no keep us in alignment with our truth, but it also prevents us from doing things we don't want to do. Mm. And no creates a launch pad for future yeses. Mm. If my time is wasted on doing things that I'm not really interested in or half-hearted, and I'm kind of muddling through my maybes, well, I don't have any room to really occupy my, my innate, my full body. Ah, oh, this is my passion. This is my reason for existing for this week or this day. Well, and it prevented a lot of resentment between us. Yeah, when we can say, <laughs> you can say no, and that's a complete sentence, everybody. Yeah. You have to justify yourself. I, I really want to second that in terms of, I think that unless you can say no without fear of negative consequences, you'll never have the full yes. I do want to add a little bit of a, a caution though, because no doesn't mean never. 
Mm. And no doesn't mean I'm out of here. No doesn't mean relationship over. And no doesn't mean that I'm still not, I'm, I'm, I'm not curious. In other words, she's got to know. Tell me more. Tell me about this. Tell me, no, I'm interested in no here. Uh, so often if I, I used to be, it's no, oh, well, <laughs> that's where I am now. Mm -hmm. Instead of, that's interesting. Hmm, what, oh. a, what about that yeah. thing? Where is the no? What, what part is the no? What, tell me more. I, I want to hear your no so I can really get connected with you. I was, I was just thinking about, thank you, um, all of you for everything that you shared. I feel, I feel so excited that we're recording this. And I think this is such a great resource. I was just thinking about what happens when I override my no. And one of the, the next things that we wanted to talk about is the difference between anger and fear fight. And, uh, and, and for me that right away, I thought, well, what happens when I override? And I, I know that there's two things. So one could be that I'm going to get scared and feel fighty. And the other is that I might be angry. And um, so I know you were going to, you wanted to speak to the fear fighty response. Yes. And what well, the difference is between these two fighting, things. Yeah, and fighting anger. Um, I was going to touch on something Keith and oh. Marlene was saying about the, um, the nose and and how you say it too, because mm -hmm. when you're in, you know, when you're fully present, which is, you know, a practice, then you can say no in a, in a gentle way, like, oh, no, I don't agree with that. Or no, I'm not, I don't want to do that. Instead of a no. I was just no. going to say, give me the yeah, fear fight. Give that. me the fear <laughs> fight version. <laughs> no, <laughs> like, I don't want to do that. Or, you know, then it becomes a, yeah. So, yeah learning to say no and not feel scared, you know, because I know for me, saying no can be scary, you know, from my childhood trauma. Now I'm going to say no to my dad, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, so having in partnerships, they be able to say, oh, no, no, I don't feel like doing that. Or, no, I don't want to eat that right now. And it feels just, I just feel so much calmer. Mm -hmm. And especially being with a partner that I can do that with. Yeah, that you're, <laughs> yeah. you're actually allowed um, did you want to speak to some of the body? Uh, yeah, for, for, for fear, fear for fear fight for me, you know, for me, I, my jaws, my jaws get super tense, you know, and stop breathing, kind of bowl up a little bit sometimes, you know, like, you know, just kind of look, you know, yep, very tense. And, and sometimes it can, it can be more subtle and be, you know, like, more like a sneaky kind of like. <laughs> like yeah. Little like, side eye. It, it's, the, like, it's the hairy eyeball. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm like, hmm. Yeah, there's like a forward, like I'm noticing your body going forward. Yeah. What I notice about fear fight is it's in the front of the body. Mm -hmm. It it bursts up the front yeah. usually. Um, there's a wavy kind of chaotic uh, feeling with fight and anger anger to me is pure it's clear and it comes through and and most of the time it's coming through from the back forward so it's like a whoa kind of a feeling and the thing that's confusing about most confusing to me about fear fight and anger is that a lot of us as you spoke to are are scared of our anger so if I'm scared of my anger, I'm not just experiencing that clarity of, which goes a lot with no, like that's not okay. I feel that, I feel angry. That clarity of that gets kind of muddled with the fear that I might feel from being angry. So the more in the relationship where anger is just like all the other core feelings, no big deal. Oh, Dean feels angry oh, I feel angry, like no big deal, that's okay. That to me is the, uh, the way through to resolving this fear of anger so that when I, I can actually get angry, get clear, boom, this is what I would like. It's, it's like when you were talking about pre like feeling present. Mm -hmm. With anger, I feel present, I feel here. 
with fear fight oh boy <laughs> it's like it's all over the place so the mixture of the two can be a little confusing but i think the more you yeah. uh, you commit i commit to anger is allowed the more i get to to feel that so yeah and then even realizing for me like anger there's a, oh, a yeah. barometer of anger you know and i thought for me it was just big or nothing you know that was what i grew up with anger was <laughs> <laughs> and and I didn't realize that I can be angry at a lot of things and be and be okay with it and be calm about it. Like, oh, I feel angry about that, and not be like I feel angry about you spilling that water. You know, like, oh, so. Yeah, Nicole, and did I you have? Totally love what you're saying, both Michelle and Dean. Like, I, one thing that stuck out to me that you said that has been really pivotal in our relationship is being able to name it. To mm. just say that's where I am that's what I'm feeling has been a powerful shift move for both of us to know where we are to start locating ourselves in the moment and recognizing okay I have this feeling but I had to first figure out what is that feeling what are all these sensations and then I could name it and it was an opportunity for us to connect rather than go in separate directions yeah that's a, it's a, so important actually what are my signals when I'm in fear fight and what are my signals when I'm in anger, when I'm angry. So and that's, yeah, go ahead, Heath, please. Knowing, knowing the body intelligence for yourself. So you know the difference. Oh, am I in fight or flight? And I'm looking, my fight looks like anger, but actually I'm fighting out of fear. If I can be aware, oh, I'm in fight fear. I can let Nicole know <laughs> I, I'm feeling scared. Yeah. Like versus getting in a bigger fight being right. like, I'm, I'm not, just one out breath name the core feeling i'm feeling scared right now i can't tell you what a relief it was mm. and in a promotion and enhancement in our relationship mm. when nicole and i started naming our feelings sounds like dean and i had opposite experiences my father was a uh, cognitive behavioral child psychologist. So anger wasn't allowed in our house. <laughs> oh. And in fact, it was trying to squeeze out and contort any negative, so-called negative feelings. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we only do happy in this house, which is humanly <laughs> oh. impossible and ridiculous. So I began to see my, you know, as a young mind, not being aware, any kind of body signals that I'm feeling angry was like oh we don't do that i got scared of my anger or if i see someone else being angry i'm like uh so when i would feel early in our relationship nicole's pissed at me i'm good at anger what did i say? <laughs> her family is very well rehearsed in it and and i would feel this stuff and she'd maybe be having physical nonverbal stuff and he he would be and be like stepping on eggshells he would be and, whistling or humming or yeah <laughs> What can I do to, it was very how, confusing. how can I make you happy? <laughs> oh. And I'd walk on eggshells and I'd be like wrangling my own feelings, which is like, I was just really pissed that she's being pissed and she's not telling me she's pissed. And now instead of that big kabuki, right. Nicole just says, Hey, I'm angry or I'm scared or I'm happy. Or, and, or, then I, and then I take that info and like, ah, oh, that's where she is. She's current. She's being current with me. She's being current with her experience that mm. she's angry. Okay, that I'm, I can let myself off the hook and know that I'm not to blame for everything that happens around me. I'm not responsible for this scary feeling that I don't know how to deal with. Yeah, and sometimes it'll be like, I feel grumpy today and I don't know why, but- mm. And I'll is. take a deep breath and I'll let myself off the hook. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, then can, and then we can sort of go on with our day and I can continue being as grumpy pants as I want. Go ahead, Bob. <laughs> I really like what you're saying about naming it and allowing the experience to be there. Because mm. when you, for, for me, if I acknowledge my anger, just like you said, Heath, I can often then go, oh, there's, I, I'm actually scared. Oh, and I can experience that. And then sometimes the more vulnerable part of me will show up, which is so healing between us. Like, I'm really sad and hurt and I long for this, but right now I can't see it. It's a very, it's a very different route to go than fight mm -hmm. anger or what looks like anger, which is fear fight. Yeah. I love that, Bob, that you just brought that up because I, I think that's the, 
the saddest thing that we get in our own way, right? So my, I let my fear get the best of me. And instead of getting what I'm, I, maybe I'm feeling uh, like I'm not getting enough attention. <laughs> well, if I come with this, like, I'm probably, probably not going to get the kind of attention that I want. So I, I really appreciate, I really appreciate that you said that, Bob, that's, uh, it's like, that's huge. Uh, the, the getting vulnerable creates the bridge, right? There's now, there's so like, I see, yeah. I see a question. Ah, great. This might be a good time to. Okay. I see question marks. So, uh, Kristen, uh, did you want to, you want to unmute and share your question? Is it okay to just say, I don't know how I'm feeling? Absolutely. Ah. Absolutely. And later on in this call, we'll talk a little bit about presencing what you're feeling. Hmm. And I think that once, once I learned that, well, because when I'm up here, like Keith was talking about, when I'm letting my head try to run the show, which it's not doing very well, I'm not in touch with what's going on in my body. So yeah, I think that presencing will, but definitely it is always okay to say, I, I, I'm, I got a bunch of stuff happening here. I don't know what's going on, but like, maybe just give me a minute or something. Yeah. Well, that was a big shift for me too, was being able to say something and not have to do anything. Or, you know, like, I feel angry. Pause. <laughs> like, and that's all I have to do. And if she says that, I don't have to be like, well, what's wrong? What did I do? You know, that was my go-to, you know, back then. It was like, someone's angry. Well, what did I do? What, what happened? You know, instead of going, oh, she's experiencing anger and it's okay. I don't have to do anything. You know, well, like, I, and oh. I think that I think that that's really key is that just because your partner's anger, angry or scared doesn't mean you have to fix it. It doesn't mean you have to do anything. Yeah. You don't yeah. have to. You don't even have to agree with it. Mm -hmm. You just have to be there. Being present is the biggest gift you can give your partner when they're having big feelings. So I wanna jump into the whole issue about when problems seem unresolvable. I imagine many of you think that that happens quite a bit. Well, in fact, John Gottman, and I'm gonna just point to um, this I'm, book that I think has, um, you know, on top of Hendrix has really made a difference for us. John Gottman says that 69% of all conflicts is actually unresolvable. He calls them perpetual. So just think about that. You've been trying to resolve these issues and 69% of them cannot be resolved. So, so for him, it's how do you approach that? Because it's all about how you approach it. So we used to have you know, the conflict and then we would fight about fighting for, for the days. next three days because you weren't approaching it right. And so that all of that is totally a waste of time. So some examples of unresolvable issues between us would be like the level of tidiness that I can live with or you can live with. Are you laughing so hard? <laughs> <laughs> the common one. Oh. Money. money money how you spend money what's your attitude towards money i save i you know i'm not going to ever buy anything but unless I've, it's on sale but i've learned how to spend and really have a good time with it you know this i mean that kind of stuff is not resolvable from the head trying to resolve it and, and that and another one is pace some you're with somebody, you're not always going to be going at the same pace. Mm -hmm. Marlene's a very fast person in a lot of ways. But, except, in, but except. then, except when I'm faster. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah. You know, another one is the, the amount of time, alone time you need. You mm. know, so Katie used to use the terms, I don't know if she still uses them, splitter and glommer. So I'm yeah. a splitter. I'm a glommer. I love alone time. I glom. do too, but I want to glom. And he's always wanting to glom with me when I want alone time. Can I come too? <laughs> <laughs> no, this is a girl's trip. You go do yoga. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, 
you know, when some of those unresolvable issues come up, you need to be present. You need to go inside and understand what you're feeling. And you need to communicate. Yeah, and what's really important, and Gottman talks about this, and it's, and it's our experience too, is it important to win? Is it important to be right? Or is it important <laughs> This thing here is it yeah. important to connect with each other mm. because we're going to have conflict. So how can we deal with it in some way and come to a place where we have a connection at the end, even though some of these things are going to come up again. I'm taking so, some deep breaths. I would say getting present. Somebody want to talk about getting present? Sure. Oh, of course. I think first we were going to. Do before, oh, I was going to say before we get present, let's let's yeah. do a little do it wrong. That's, that's, yeah. The yeah. yeah. Yes, the horseman. Yeah. So yeah. So what we're um what we want to share with you next? One of the things that we said we were going to share are four addictive relationship patterns. So these are patterns that John Gottman called the pattern, uh, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. <laughs> and, yes. Destroy and ruin all relationships yeah. everywhere your world will be over. <laughs> so not addressing these, not good. Let's just say that. Um, these- It just leads to the end times. It just, it just, you know, it leads to doom and gloom. No big deal. So what we want to do is we were playing with botifying before. You had a little experience with botifying. So we'd like to do this again. And this time we're going to botify the four patterns. So what we're going to do is play with both doing the action and receiving the action. So you decide which one that you're going to try on first. So we're going to go with criticism. So criticism. What does criticism look like for you? And you can practice criticizing what that looks like or being criticized. Yeah, being criticized. Yeah. Yes, yeah, exactly I'm being criticized that. right now. Oh, I don't move no. at all. I stop breathing. Yeah, no breath. No breath. No breath when I'm criticizing either. Yeah, no <laughs> breath when criticizing. Lots of adrenaline. Lots and lots of adrenaline. Lots of heat. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I got I'm sweating. sweating and yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the next one is contempt. Ugh. 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 Make some snapping noise with your mouth. Ugh. Ugh. I can't believe you're doing it. But usually we don't use words. Yeah. 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 Mm. Come on, look I have contempt for what you just did. I can't do anything right. You can contempt yourself too. <laughs> yeah, and practice receiving that. Receiving the. the How do you receive it? Yeah. Ooh. How does it feel like to get receiving contempt? <laughs> Got to defend myself. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Next one, defensive. Defensive. Yeah, that's where we're going. Yeah. So defensive behavior. This can have so many layers. And we're encouraging you all practice this. Right? Oh, yeah. Play with us. I, I, Everybody. It's yeah, not, please. It's not just a, a performance show. It's a whole improv group. <laughs> yeah, I forgot. I forgot that part. I was having so much fun botifying. You do it too. <laughs> I don't want to. Don't make me want to. <laughs> no breath again. No breath. Ooh. Ooh. Oh. All right, I'm glad there's only one more. So this one is sulking or stonewalling. Oh. Oh. No way. Oh. Oh. Mm. I could stay here a long time. 
can do this all night. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> yeah, and what does it feel like to have to be Stonewall? To to have sulking. What does that bring up? Very familiar. <laughs> I grew up I grew up with that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So everybody, I love what you said, Marlene. Notice which ones of those are familiar. What feel does it feel familiar to yeah. give or receive one of those flavors more than the other? And beginning to identify them uh, and try them on. And what we're doing here with this experiment, mm -hmm. thought experiment, body experiment, is to actually help you release from the contempt, from the criticism, the stonewalling, the defensiveness by making it bigger. Getting right? really big. Not using, your, not using your brain to get rid of your or your partner's criticism, but using your body. And not doing, not using your body to like, I'm going to do the opposite of criticism, but actually going into criticism bigger and exaggerating it, much like a comedian or a clown would exaggerate things. And when you add a little expansion and some whimsy and impracticality, things really begin to open. We really get to unkink Yeah, we get to move flow. that energy. And it's hard not to laugh at Heath when he gets exaggerated. <laughs> <laughs> There's, there's, so much, there's so much information there's so much information in doing this like just now when bob turned away from me i had a flash of my father and one time when my father actually sat and turned his back on us and sat there for like hours at a time wow I, you know i it just that and so right my whole body right now is tingling with mm. a new information that i just got mm. from because that's not one of Bob's moves that mm -hmm. he typically does. No, I do that. Um, <laughs> you so, do that one good. <laughs> so I, have, I have goosebumps all over my body from realizing, and that's probably something I learned to do because I do. I would more do it from him, so I learned it from my dad. But mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm really appreciating mm -hmm. this opportunity to get. Oh, that's where I learned that. I don't have to do that. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, and, uh, you know, for me, I really encourage everyone, you know, for me, I also, I'm a fitness, I'm a fitness coach. So like anything, you got to practice and really take the time to recognize these tools and how powerful it is. Because when you do it, when you move your body, that's when the answers come up. It's not sticking in your head. So doing these practices as goofy as it looks, it releases so many, so much. And then you get the ahas like, oh, that's what we, that reminds me of Marlene was saying. And so practice and practice. You know, if you can practice when you're not in fight, in fight, because you won't be able to practice. You're yeah, be yeah, fighting. that's not going to happen. So yeah. just, you know, all these little tools and things that we're showing you to like, oh, how do I do that? And, and practice and see what it feels like. So when you're in it, you're like, oh, I'm feeling a little content right now. <laughs> I'm feeling a little defensive right now. Mm -hmm. So really practicing is the key to, you know, to anything. You gotta practice. Mm. And that brings us to what are we going to practice? What do we want to practice? So exaggerating the the we want to call the four horsemen. So exaggerating the the different ways that we experience our fighty energy, I would say. That's mostly uh, run by fear fight. So that's one thing. And then there are a whole host of wonderful presencing practices that we want to at least drop a few in. And I know Keith and Nicole were planning on sharing some. Sure. So uh, presencing moves or presencing practices are done a, a number of ways. And we really like to use our, our bodies as the exemplar. And I bet all of us have our own like signature presencing move. And I'd love to hear what yours are. But for me, the big move was actually turning towards and, and staying put. <laughs> when we get, uh, in get into conflict for me, the big the big easy move for me when in, when we were in arguments was to throw up my hands and get out of dodge. So for me, turning towards Heath when I was when I feel myself scared and angry or angry, 
taking a breath and really telling myself, okay, I'm going to stay, I'm going to stay <laughs> and be with has really changed how we connect and communicate and find resolutions and find different options and possibilities. Yeah, so the, it might not sound like a big deal, but just physically moving your orientation, preferably so your hearts are kind of lined up, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, preferably so that you are able to see their entire face and their expressions. So turning towards physically, but also turning towards emotionally, becoming emotionally available when even things are come, like I mentioned, I didn't learn how to do anger as a young person. I didn't know healthy anger. I heard that a decade ago in Hendrix. I'm like, that's baloney. What does that mean? And I'm happy to say I've learned that anger can be a healthy resource for connecting me with my truth and nurturing our relationships. So how can we turn toward be available, even for the things in our partner that we would like to be different? <laughs> those perpetuals, those 69% of things that are in conflict, how can we turn toward our partner in a, a loving way? And around the fun and happy stuff, is very it's really easy. easy. Anybody, and it's a great time to practice. Anybody can meditate in a cave, but can <laughs> you can you in the throes of conflict and, and preferably practice this when you're not in conflict? As Dean says, you need to train. We don't have education in how to be emotionally intelligent and transparent in our basic curriculum, usually with our families and almost exclusively in our schools. So how can we use our relationship, which, by the way, when you partner with someone, unconsciously, you're not just picking the person, you're picking everything that comes with them so that you and the other can heal something that could never be learned, mm -hmm. discovered, or healed on your own. Just with you. Me and you got this thing going on. This so that, healing to happen that's unique to us. And for me, that just opens my heart and just creates a whole new level of compassion for all of our fear, all of our fight, all of our expressions and emotions that rise and fall. And turning towards this for me is like showing my my underbelly, like my soft belly parts. So it's it's an expression of my of being vulnerable and letting myself be exposed in this moment of when I don't feel like maybe I don't have control or where I don't feel understood or I don't feel whatever. <laughs> Do you have a favorite presency? One of my all time favorite presency moves is simply shifting my breath. And I love a Fritz Perls quote. Some of you know Gestalt therapy and the co-founder Fritz and his wife develop uh, what's called Gestalt therapy, a very humanistic way to relate together and use our bodies in part to help get deeper healing and connection with the other. And they shared this great quote about the breath. Uh, fear is excitement without the breath. And if you break that down, that means that when you inevitably feel fear, because all humans are going to get scared at some point or another, there's no fear campaign is just a, a marketing campaign. It's not a real human possibility. When we notice ourselves feeling fear, if we can shift our breath, we can move that fear into excitement. Think of a time where you've been a little shaky, a little anxious, a little scared. Kind of similar vibratory sense of being excited. Oh, what's going to happen next? The difference is the breath. So when we can generate deep breathing, when I can, instead of go into the verbal defensiveness of, ah, blah, 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 oh, yeah, well, blah, 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 blah. And instead, I can presence myself with my breath. Not so I can have a more articulated, competent debate or argument, but so that I'm actually taking a step to be kind to me. And then by me modeling and actually bodifying kindness to me, I become more available and generous to do it for my partner. Self-care isn't about... Uh, just about yourself. It starts there, but always self-care, kindness is going to help everybody in your proximity. It's going to be a benefit for anybody around you. Mm. What are some of your favorite presency moves with each other? Nice. Well, I'll say a, a couple of things. One is, and I really go for the spacing, mm -hmm. is drop into my body and say, what is my experience? Mm. 
Mm. What is it? Okay. And, and then just be with that. And can I say something about that? Sometimes it takes a while. It's really good not to talk all the time. <laughs> it's really good to sometimes face, look, experience what's going on here. I wonder what's going on there. Oh, what's going on here? And then go back and forth for quite a while like that. And then maybe some words can show up. So, yeah, so yeah. describing body sensations, mm -hmm. I, I might I might say to somebody, so describe it as if I'm an alien and I don't even have a body. So I can really get a sense. And so that tends to be unarguable when I'm just saying, you know, my throat, my throat is tight, my jaw is tight, my stomach is tight, or there's squishy stuff happening, whatever. Another thing, um, Dean mentioned practice, and, and I strongly recommend regularly, like I would say even daily, having a five to 10 minute practice where you just go, I'm angry about, I'm angry about, I'm angry about, I'm angry about, I'm scared about, I'm scared about, I'm scared about, I'm scared about. So we usually say, I'm angry, I'm scared, I'm sad, I long for, I appreciate. And you do that regularly when you're not in conflict. You're just clearing stuff out. The key is you don't respond to your partner. You there's, just listen. There's no, if he says he's angry about what I made for dinner, no big deal. So, and I don't also spend a whole lot of time about it. I'm just angry about it. It's a matter of fact thing. So I usually suggest I'm angry about I'm scared about, I'm sad about, I long for, and I appreciate. And that's taken out of Gay and Katie's 10 minute heart talk, which was in a book like it, I read 30 years ago or whatever, but just that. 10 just, second miracle. Yeah. 10 second miracle. I was gonna say, yeah, 10 second miracle. Um, right. just, just that going back and forth um, regularly. Do it before you're going to have sex. Do it before you're going to go out on a date. Do it before you're you're going to have dinner. Whatever. Just so you just clear the decks, clear the air. Yeah, I love what you're what you're talking about is like preventative medicine, right? I brush my teeth. I go to the dentist. I'm I'm giving attention to those things that if I don't give attention to, cause me problems later on. And what you're talking about, that's one of our favorite practices as well. And that is it, it's what I see that as maintenance. I see that as, as preventative medicine for the relationship. Um, and one of the ones we haven't mentioned yet is fear melters. So this is Katie Hendricks, fear melters. I'll put a resource in. If you haven't, if you don't know anything about fear melters, lots and lots of resources on the foundation for conscious living.org. So you can learn all about it. We have fantastic resources there. Um, it's basically movements that match each of, or melt each of the four fears that we get into. Um, so there's, again, videos, we don't need to talk about the rest of it here, but I wanted to mention that because that's, I would say movement, breath is my first as well. So that's already been uh, stated. Curiosity, uh, Bob, you were demonstrating curiosity. So that's, it's like, hmm, I wonder what's going on over there. Hmm, I wonder what's going on for me. And I know your favorite. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, excuse me, um, my favorite is the pause. So when something's happening, instead of reacting, I pause. I check in with what's happening with me. So usually take a breath. And then, you know, we make commitments to each other. And I, and I go into, I'm making a commitment to see Michelle as my ally. And so that turns, you know, her face from enemy <laughs> to, is she my ally right now? Hmm. And then I also, for me, just presence myself with, okay, what's what's happening with me, and what is my part in what's going on here, and so taking responsibility, and that really, you know, giving myself that few seconds or minute or two minutes to just process that, and it's like, oh, okay, it's nothing to do with what just happened. Usually, it's mm -hmm. <laughs> something to do with the way I reacted or took that in, took it personal, and then be like, oh, hmm, 
And then, and then looking oh, at that was because uh, yeah. I, I, I got angry at my kids. I, yeah, I got Usually angry at my kid a little while ago or something like that. So that's the thing. It's like what we're dragging in, right? Yeah. Can That can be a big part of it. So presencing what's really happening. I'm noticing the time. I want to give a, a, a couple of, maybe we can take one or two questions. And please, if you have questions, put them in the chat. I'm going to go ahead and, and post the, uh, yeah, raise your hand if you have a question. Probably have time for one or two if they're quick. So anybody that has a question. Feel free to raise your electronic hand or just go ahead and unmute yourself. Anybody have a question? Uh, Darlene's hand is up. Question. I, um, I love that daily practice. Um, does that ever initiate static with your partner? <laughs> <laughs> and then what? <laughs> yeah, well, my so my partner and I have an agreement that when we're doing that daily practice, we're not responding to each other. So there's there's no static there. I can say anything, he can say anything. If something needs to be dealt with, then we'll go, we'll probably put it aside and then we'll use some of our, we prefer not to spend a lot of time talking about stuff. We'd rather play with it. We'd rather like grab a pair of socks and make it into a ball and toss or, or um, you know, do the exaggeration, the botifying, or, or do some little bit of play fighting about it, you know, like, like, because it's not the content that's important. It's the connection. Yeah, that's such a, that, I love that, Marlene, is your commitment to connection is bigger than anything else with being right being making something more important whatever that is your commitment to connection is what you're it sounds like you're honoring most and uh i really appreciate you bringing that up um, so, yeah i love to use that one too as a commitment to connection rather than being right even if i am right <laughs> yeah. even if i'm absolutely sure i'm there's, right doesn't matter yes yeah. i want aren't, I have the aren't we always right I, 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 oh always yeah right. yeah really <laughs> According to me, I'm always right. <laughs> I love it. So any final words from our uh, our couples here? Anything that's you want to throw in before we close? I'm really glad everybody chose to be with us uh, today. And I, I hope you got at least one actionable idea that you can start incorporating into your life, not next year, uh, but like maybe tomorrow. <laughs> uh, again, 1% theory, 99% practice. So when you get very interested in having a, a loving, thriving relationship, it requires a tremendous amount of practice. Yeah. And, and you might as well have the practice be fun. Yes. Right. That's the thing I love the most about what I learned from the Hendricks is that we can have a good time while we're transforming our relationship and our life. And it starts with a commitment to having a good time. And uh, yeah, Marlene and Bob, any, any last words? Find opportunities to play. <laughs> love it. Love it. And laugh. Yeah. And laugh. Because, you know, a lot of it can be really humorous. <laughs> yes, when we let it. I love it. On that note, thank you, everyone, for being with us tonight. Absolutely loved being with all of you these wonderful couples uh, enjoy so much your presence. And I learn every time he said something about that before we got on the call that he learns every time. And I do too. And I so appreciate each of you and everyone who's here and uh, we'll see you again. Uh, join us actually for the big leap bridge classes. The next one is gay Hendricks. So join us for that class. You can find it on the foundation for conscious living. Thanks so much. If you want to unmute and say goodbye, love to see you all. Thanks. Bye, Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. That was great. Bye. That was great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>